Cheers, Nick. <laughs> well, look, this is the start of this relationship, right? We always talk about what I drink on this podcast, and it's gone from tea with honey to I had a fruity beer, and then I decided to do a whiskey. We have two podcasts back to back tonight, so I'm and I've got a fly tomorrow, so I'm going with the coconut water. I'll be the more, you know, you know, what's the word? Mature individual on this podcast tonight. You're drinking beer and Cody is imbibing whiskey and it's still very much light outside at your house, Cody. I don't know. I, I like to think that, that the whiskey and the beer are the adult move, but that's just, that's just me. Yeah. Responsi- if, yeah, if you're going for responsibility, that's a whole nother, that's a different, it's a different topic, but adults responsibility maturity yeah it's about the same thing okay hey let's do a hunting podcast called blood origins and drink coconut water on it (laughs) thanks cody absolutely hey it's better than that tea you had with that little honey stick stir thing i thought i was gonna fall out of my chair in that episode (laughs) well Well, uh, uh, we are glad to have another guest with us for this week's roundup and uh, it's no other than the infamous Nick Hoffman. Nick, introduce yourself, please. <laughs> infamous. Uh, infamous is true, uh, but maybe not for any good reasons. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really famous for being uh, drunk around the circle bar during SHOT Show. That's, I'm definitely inf- infamous for that. I, I uh, have no, been known to put a couple back, you know, things like that, SCI, things like that. But no, I'm a musician. I'm, um, I'm uh, the host of a show on the outdoor channel called Nick's Wild Ride. I'm a singer, I'm a dad, a pilot. Um, and I like to think a pretty nice guy, yeah. fairly nice guy, you know? No, we appreciate that. And uh, yeah, you definitely are a nice guy. Otherwise we wouldn't have had you on here. Um, <laughs> But tell me a little bit more, because I obviously, being um, South African, not being you know from America, Cody gives me shit all the time about. See, I went ahead and swore just because I had to get it out the way for you, Cody. Um, he I sometimes say bad words, Nick. Yeah, it takes one to know one, buddy. Uh, I'm I'm trying. I'm on my best behavior here, but we'll see how that goes at the end of this beer. Get so a few more beers. When, when Cody talks about different country singers and whatnot, I have to show my, a little bit of my ignorance. Um, but you are, your, your claim to fame would be fiddle playing, right? Well, sure. Yeah, that's how it all started for me. I mean, I, I'm a singer. I always have been. And so I'm a country music artist and I'm a and fiddle player. I'm a fiddle player front man. You know, I, uh, um, I kind of fashion myself a modern day Charlie Daniels kind of artist. You know, if I had to compare myself to someone, um, I certainly don't think I'm Charlie Daniels by any means, but I'm a fiddle player and I'm a front man and he's my hero. You know what I mean? So um, I kind of walked down that fiddle player front man kind of uh, path a little bit. So, and you've got to play for him with him quite a couple of times, right? I, I, actually, the only time I ever played on stage with him was at the one of his last performances at SCI last year. Oh, wow. uh, it, was, it was a really, what an honor. I mean, to, to share the stage with my, with my hero, uh, which it might've been his last concert. I'm not a hundred percent sure if it wasn't his last, it was one of his very last. And it was an honor, you know, to do that. And, and I've had, um, I've gotten to play with several other artists, uh, big artists as a side guy and as a fiddle player. And I've had my own songs on the radio with a band called the farm. And uh, now I got a brand new album coming out soon too. So, yeah, the music is how it all started for me. It wasn't, I didn't set out to be a, a, a outdoor channel guy. That's for sure. Um, I set out to be, uh, you know, on the radio and, and hunting was always part of it, you know, uh, part of my life, but it certainly wasn't part of my career. Uh, that, that came out of nowhere, you know? Cool. Cool. Well, we're going to dive into what's been happening around the scenes uh, this week. I have, I have, I have a quick update real quick though. Um, what Robbie was referring to was on two episodes ago, I brought up Chris Christopherson. Uh huh. Um, and Robbie, Robbie's reply was, Who's Chris Christopherson? Um, uh, so that's, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. So please stay, please stay with us. Please stay with us, Nick. We'll try and make that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. I still hey, man. Know. I still you don't can't know win them all. Yeah. Dude, come on. Go 
go find out. Go find some Chris Christopherson. Look, I got I got fourteen hours in a plane tomorrow. I'll try and figure it out tomorrow. Nothing. That's the rule. All you could do is listen to songs that Chris Christopherson either wrote, maybe one little one you've heard of called Bobby McGee, or mm -hmm. listen to Chris Christopherson sing because the man is a legend. Okay, I'm done. I'm sorry to sidetrack this deal. What's the topic? <laughs> let's start off. Let's start on an easy topic. The idea between consumptive use and non-consumptive use. And typically where this is played out is the whole hunting versus ecotourism scenario uh, in Africa, namely, that uh, the consumptive use model is the model in which hunters op uh, operate under, in which we go out and we consume a resource uh, that is sustainable, hopefully, right? That's what we intend to consume. And uh, the non-consumptive use side of things is the ecotourism because they don't quote unquote, take anything off the landscape. Well, at least that's what everyone believes. So why don't I start with our guest maybe and say, you know, what do you, what do you think of the whole consumptive versus non-consumptive debate when it comes to, and you don't have to, you don't have to limit it to ecotourism because the the response that we got was tied to veganism. Yeah, I I mean, look, the 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 one thing that I'm not is is an expert on any of this stuff, and I'll never claim to be. But I I try to educate myself the best I can. It's why I'm a fan of what you guys do. I think you bring a lot of a lot of um, topics to the forefront that nobody will attack. I don't hear anybody talking about consumptive versus non-consumptive, and I think that's important. Um, what I I can tell you what I what I've seen. And what I what I know that I from firsthand experience, um, when it comes to I don't like those two words first off because I think they're too, they're they the, 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 def, that, the those words yeah the, well I think that let's go ahead and use them though I you know I don't know I don't really have good better words necessarily off the top of my head but I can tell you that. Sure, hunters are consumptive. There's no doubt about it. But let's talk about what they do with the consumption. I mean, you you mentioned Africa, and I, I know that's a hot button topic, and you know, but we can we can talk about Africa all day long because it's a great example. Um, and it's I've seen it firsthand. You go over and I I went over on an African hunt and did an own use hunt, so I didn't take any trophies. I I, I hunted, you know, on on a you know either depredation tags or or uh you know problem animal tags or things like that and i watched every single piece of of an animal be used sure that's consumption but that's that's you know helping the ecosystem of of a of a of a village by taking out a problem animal one that was old something that they need if they needed meat or one they were having trouble with they used every piece of it that's okay to me I'm okay with that. And I recognize that not everybody is, but I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I don't. And I think it's because it's been the way that we've done it for a long time. And it also supports um, conservation in a lot of ways too. And I know those are, man, that's a big, long answer, but I know what I've seen from consumption, consumptive people. And, and I like it. Now it doesn't mean that that's always the case. There's a lot of bad examples of a lot of bad hunters out there, but you know, there's a lot of good ones too. Cody, do you believe that there is such a thing as non-consumptive use? Oh, I think it's a term that was created by someone that then anti-hunters latched onto. Um, and I think, and th th to be fair, we'd, we'll give a quick shout out first name only to Tony that sent us an e a uh, Facebook message, I believe, and kind of sent us down this path on this discussion. That it, if you look at, you take the African example, and I don't know the numbers, but if you take one African consumptive wildlife person, which would be a hunter, someone who is going to, in, to someone who's going to kill animals and the revenue generated that goes into the sustainment of those animals. I don't know the numbers. I'll say, I think it's several hundred. Hmm. 
I was wrong. Rob threw up a cue card and I overestimated, so I'll admit it. But it then takes 77 non-consumptive, which is which in the case of Africa is an ecotourist, which by all means, I'll speak for myself and Blood Origins, we are gigantic fans of ecotourism. Mm -hmm. We don't knock this other group of people generating revenue that helps protect animals in Africa. But I think if you take 77 people and their fuel, that was their traffic, their not destruction, I want to use destruction, but their human influence on this wild area. That's pretty consumptive, in my opinion. It's pretty, it's pretty, you have to take 77 of those to generate the income and in dollars that go back into the economy, conservation, and the communities in, in those African countries. Keep doing it, please. I'm not telling you to stop doing it. I am telling you that there's a whole bunch of people in this world right now having discussions, especially here in the United States even, over how great it is that everyone's getting outdoors, but oh crap, everyone's getting outdoors and the outdoors are getting torn up. Mm -hmm. And you have, you have 77 people's worth of influence on that wild area as opposed to one. And yes, I'm, someone's going to say to me, that one is killing animals and taking them. You're right, but that's just one person generating that amount of dollars, that amount of return on investment for the situation. So to me, it's not a competition. It's a two things happening, um, two things happening that bad comes out of both of them, right? I mean, there's just like, just like Nick said, there's, there's people do bad things. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, right? Every group of people, there's bad country music singers. All right. There, are, I, I did it. I said that I said it, but is Chris every group of people, one of those bad country singers? No, no, stop, stop it. Don't get us back on that. We'll get, we'll get derailed and I'll figure out how to kick you out of this. And Nick and I uh, will continue. Yeah. That's a, that's but, a, that's a sacrilegious statement. Stop it. It was one of the highwaymen. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go on. But I, I, I also want to point out really quickly before I turn it back over to Robbie to finish this up with smart science stuff, that the other angle to this is, as opposed to consumptive versus non-consumptive use of wildlands, Tony in his email pointed out, if all these people around the world quit eating this meat, right? If we just stop, Farm, you're talking about farmed meat. Farm. No, no, talking I'm talking about, about wildlife. Meat, right? no, this, okay. no, we're talking about it. We're talking about well, from a vegan's perspective, it's actually both. But if all these people quit doing that, we've got to look at the consumption of the earth that will happen to feed these people. Um, so there's that was the original email, and I think there's a really valid discussion to be had there as well. That there's a lot of consumption of the earth and resources. 8 billion people. We well, talked about ecotourism and and I the first thing that came to mind for me on being if if ecotourism is non-consumptive um the but that it still has a major impact is what you're talking about the first thing that comes that comes to mind is climbing you know the the mountain climbing like um Mount Everest for example or, you know, some of these where, you know, you've got, you've seen the pictures of lines and lines of, of, of people and just, and just tons of plastic and, and waste that is sitting on, on these mountainsides. It'll never, they'll never go away. Nobody's going to go up there and clean it up. You know, they try, they say they're going to try, but that's, a, that's consumptive in its own way too. And, and I guess what I'm saying is, and I think what I'm hearing you say too, is let's call it, let's call apples, apples and oranges, oranges, you know, and, and that's, that's important. Let's not just demonize hunters for being consumptive and call guys that hike non-consumptive, right? Isn't that kind of exactly. what you're saying? Exactly. You know, the whole 100%. argument that people, you know, that I've seen and we've used it a little bit in the past is the whole like, okay, you claim you're a vegan. There seems to be, you know, a vast majority of keyboard warriors seem to be vegan versus the populace seems to be in the minority when it comes to veganism. But, you know, they always, the, the counter to that is, you, you know, your lifestyle, your choice of lifestyle also has some consumptive use tied to it. And, 
unfortunately, when it comes from a science perspective, you know, you can find science to to back up any any sort of position, right? And, and really, you can see it in four positions. One, you can see it as that a vegan lifestyle is more sustainable and healthier for the planet. There's going to be science that backs that up. There's going to be science that shows that it's not good for yeah. the planet. Then you've got the consumptive animal raising science that shows that, yeah, you can have sustainable cattle operations and chicken operations and wildlife operations that are good for humans and good for the planet. And also the counter, which is that they're bad for humans and bad for the planet. So you can find all four sides of the science argument when it comes down to this. It's just a matter of being able to be educated in terms of what you're saying, how you're saying it, what it means, and being able to prob, you know, probe the other side's argument and say, hey, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about yeah. that? Well, it's like my grandpa used to always say, the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? And and it's oftentimes it's just about what you're looking at and how, how you look at it. And that's the comes the truth with hunting in general. I mean, it's it's a it's a slippery slope. You can get down one angle and and one rabbit hole really fast, but it's it's a much more complicated thing than that. You know? Absolutely. One thousand percent. All right. Nick, how about you tell us what, what we're gonna talk about next? <laughs> um of all the topics that you 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 brought up, um the one that applies to me the most is, uh, I mean, on a daily basis, is, is the social media question, you know, how, how hunters present themselves in, on social media. And uh, I can't remember the exact angle of that, that title you had, the, the headline you had there. Yeah, the title was hunters need to be held accountable for what they post to social media. I feel, I mean, I'll open it up to you guys first, but I mean, that, that, that's, um, to me as important right now as anything, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, the social media thing is a, that, you know, the, the value of social media is a whole nother conversation. You know what I mean? That I don't even want to get into right now, but, um, my opinion there's no... is that social media is the scourge of hunting. Social media right now is sinking hunting. Okay. I agree. Hunter, but hold on. I've made this, I was a social media for a living. So what I did was a social media advertising consultant. It's a human problem. Instagram didn't do it. The app didn't do it. The, it pe Come on, it's people. Cody. If the, app no, wasn't it's there, people. if the app wasn't there, we wouldn't have this problem. When people have been opposed to the things and pictures that hunter of, hunters have taken forever. We wouldn't have it on this scale. But the problem is not social media. Yep. The problem is people, you, you're on social media. Both of you are on social media and you're hunters. Are you ruining hunting for other people? Yeah. It's, it, it, in, Instagram didn't force you to do it. it it's a people problem. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think all the negative effects that this article talks about and that you feel are out there and they're happening. Mm -hmm. But it's a people problem. It's not a social media problem. I agree with you. Um, and I, I very much so, and I'll, I'll give it th to you through the lens of the way I grew up and then the lens of social media that as I deal with it now, I didn't grow up in a hunting family. So nobody in my family hunted. I always wanted to hunt though. I always knew I was one of those guys that was wired to do it. And I believe it. I believe that some of us are wired to be hunters and some of us are wired to be gatherers. And I'm proof of that. I don't know why, but I wanted to go hunting from the time that I was, was, little and it wasn't just hunting it was just being outside following tracks and looking at leaves and everything i wanted i wanted to do it all i say that to tell you that it always really bothered my mom and to a certain extent my dad who did a little bit of hunting when he was younger but didn't really like it when they'd see a deer on strapped to the hood during deer season going down the road that skewed my mom to dislike hunters dislike them hated them why? Because mean, she felt when she, she saw it on Instagram. When she saw when she saw it, no, when she saw I'm talking about before Instagram. Th that right. before Instagram, she saw a hood, a, a a deer going down the road on the hood, and 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 it made her hate hunters. Right? Well, that was you know the social media for hunters of the time. That, that's how they that's how they showed off their kill. It was in the back of the truck. It was whatever. If she saw antlers, she was offended, 
and it made her dislike hunters because she didn't understand anything other than what she saw right there. And I, it's a microcosm of somebody's hunting tradition. If somebody's, and I, I still, if I, if I had to put it in a hunt uh, on a, on a hood, I would wrap it in a tarp out of respect. That's me, but I'm different than that. Right. Instagram is the same way. If you ask me, it is a hood of a car going through a little town and you, we have a responsibility as hunters to try and not piss off people like my mom. And I know that there are people that, that go, Nope, screw that. That's not how I feel. That I disagree completely. I think it's what's the stats like? You know, 50% of people sit on the fence. They don't really have an opinion of hunting. And if they happen to get an ad for for or fo- find a hashtag that you somehow found them on and it's a picture of a tongue hanging out on a deer and somebody or some naked guy behind a turkey like I saw yesterday, boom, they fall to the fence of anti-hunting forever. It's hard to get them back. But if you, if you show hunting in a positive light on Instagram or Facebook, you can, you can make them go, Hey, that's pretty cool. I want to know more. That's my opinion. I think it's the, I think it's just, it's no different than, than strapping your deer to your hood 30 years ago. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's how I feel about it. No, it may, uh, not only does it make sense. I agree completely across the board that I, I, I think there's, I think there's maybe, I, I would give that there's maybe two groups. Um, unfortunately, all three of us probably did ignorant or dumb things Absolutely. prior, prior to adulthood, right? We're, we're, we're still doing them now. There were probably some really dumb things. I know there was for me doing some really dumb things when I was 16, 17. Um, and that's some of it some of it you see are very young people who haven't spent the time just on the earth to ponder the consequences of their actions some of it is that the other group i see is i'm gonna do this really extreme thing so i get a bunch of likes and clicks and follows right Mm -hmm. and some of those people are as old as the hills it doesn't have anything to do with age it has to do with what your priorities are. Um, those people were doing those things prior to social media. Social media just not only threw it in front of everyone, if your account is public, gave everyone in the world the chance to comment back on it. Um, the, the young kids, youth are always going to be youth. I, I have to take that role um, or that stance on it, or I can't defend the dumbass things I did when I was a kid. <laughs> But the older ones who are, I can't process that I shot a turkey, so I decided to get naked behind it. That, yeah. Those kind of things, I, those people need to spend a little bit of time under the auspice of my father, because I'm 45 years old, and I think my 68-year-old dad would beat the shit out of me mm-hmm. if I did that. Well, you know? and... I, and I don't, that, I don't, that goes back to responsibility not, and impact, right? Like people don't realize right. the impact that they have. And that goes to education. That's why we're having this conversation in the first place. I mean, mm-hmm. the fact is that those guys, if those guys knew, there's two, I, I, we're talking about different camps, right? The people that get naked behind a turkey probably fall into two camps too. They're the ones that don't realize the impact they might be having on hunting in general. And then, and if they did, they probably go, oh, dude, you know what, now that you put it like that, I shouldn't have done that. The other ones are the ones that just don't care. They, right. they, they're, they've they been raised like that and they go, you know what, I do what I want to do. This is America and F you. You know, and that's too bad because if they knew the impact and we're starting to feel the impact and we see it, you know, and that's why we're talking about this. I mean, I think we have a job as hunters and I, you know what, I don't, I don't mind saying it because I know that there are people that will dislike the statement, but I don't mind saying it. We have a job as hunters to, to clean it up a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. Share your, share your tongue, hanging out photos with your buddies on, on your phone. You know what I mean? But but the stuff you put out there is everybody's going to see. And I, I just think in the turn, in the lens of those fence sitters, I really do. How do you, how do you swing the fence sitters over to, they don't have to become hunters, but at least they're, they're going to maybe support legislation that, that supports hunting and and outdoor lifestyle. If, but if you, if you lose them, it's really hard to get them back. 
Nick, are you, yeah. uh, I'll play devil's advocate. Are you saying that hunters should not put dead animals on social media? Absolutely not. But I, I'm for, definitely for, and this is where the, the rub comes in with a lot of people. And, and I'm okay with, with the, the spirit of conversation about, I, I, I'm the guy who cleans up blood before I take a photo on it, of an animal. I take respectful photos. I try to anyway, you know what I mean? And I guess everybody has a different idea of what's respectful. Um, I take what I think are respectful photos and I try to present um, hunting in a, in a, in a way that, that, that it maybe isn't as offensive as some people, other people do. And that's okay with me because I'm also in a different position. Um, you know, I don't have a traditional kind of hunting brand, if you will. And so mine's more of a, it hits some non-endemic people. And I hope that maybe if somebody's watching with their wife who doesn't hunt, maybe I can present hunting in a different way. So I'm looking at it in a slightly different, through a slightly different lens. And I admit that, but no, I think we, I think it's okay. I don't make excuses for, for hunting animals. Um, but I, I think what's it hurt to not post the bloody ones? What's it hurt? Or what's it hurt to show, if you're going to post something bloody show, show meat being cut or something being used, you know? But a tongue hanging out on a deer in the back of a truck, to me, that doesn't do us any good. I don't have a problem with it personally. Like if I see one, it doesn't offend me because I get it. I understand what that moment is, you know, but sorry, go ahead. And it, this just popped into my head. Sometimes stuff comes out of my mouth. It doesn't make near as much sense, but <laughs> I don't think what's as important to me is the fact yeah, this may not make sense. I don't think it's that you clean up the pictures. I think that in your brain, you just think about that process. Like it's the, it's the thinking about what should I do that is the right thing here, as opposed to what you actually do. Does that make sense? And I, I, I think that goes back to that. I think that the bulk of these people just didn't think about it, right? They're, they're, they, they're like, this would be funny. It's not really funny, but that's what they thought. They haven't processed it in their mind. Maybe they haven't spent enough time on earth. Um, but to me, it's the fact, you know, that you think about what's the right thing to do here. And I don't think that's just about hunting, right? I mean, there's a whole lot of other social media stuff that happens that my, my kids, my, my daughter's 24 now. So kind of got to the teenage years when none of us really knew what the hell social media was. Uh -huh. um, but it scared the crap out of me. What, she's just going to do some silly goofball thing that's preserved in time if she decides she needs to post it, right? Yep. And that's why I think it's a bigger human thing of, if you're that guy that just doesn't care and you got naked behind a turkey because you thought a bunch of people would like it and you knew it was disrespectful and ignorant, I don't know what to say to you. We're not going to save you. Yeah. But it's, it's all those people out there that didn't think about it that I hope, hope, listen and go, huh. You know, like you said, maybe, maybe there, maybe there is some, maybe you took that quick shot with blood everywhere, right. When you got there and, and, and that goes to your hunting buddies, mm -hmm. right? Because just, Hey, look what I, I shot a deer, not celebrating the blood. That's not what you're doing. You just, I got a deer. But then take a little time and respect the animal. Um, yep. And there, and there again, are the camps, the people that think, man, do, uh, you shouldn't be posting any, any trophy photos. And you know what? If that's your experience, I'm cool with that. You know, if that's what, if that's what your experience is, that's fine with me. That's not me. I want to I wanna share, and I'm not, I'm not embarrassed of it, but I am, I am absolutely worried about those people that – maybe don't have context. That's kind of what you're talking about. The, if you send that picture to your buddies, they understand the context. If you're in the back of a truck holding that thing up to, to somebody else who hunts, they might understand the context and not be offended. But, you know, the context is important. And if, if they don't have it, then, then you're just going to put somebody off and turn them against us. Yeah, the context comes with the narrative, right? The, and the right. comment post and whatnots. And, you know, we've said it a lot on here. We've said it on Talking Heads thinking the mere act of thinking yeah is going to save hunting yeah and cody i interrupted you but i think that's what he just said no, is what exactly. you're what you're after right yeah i just say it with an accent that's much cooler <laughs> cody so much sexier right <laughs> yeah. 
So let me pose this question to you, Nick. Uh, yeah. Have you ever hunted an elephant? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, have you any desire to hunt an elephant? So I'm, I definitely fall into that camp of people that said, um, now I see slightly hypocritically um, that, oh, you don't, oh like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, no, 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 it wasn't that. I don't want to go to Africa. Don't care to go to Africa. Hunt, I, I grew up in the Midwest. I hunt deer. Um, why would anyone go and hunt in Africa? That makes no sense to me. Literally, I saw it in magazines, w wouldn't even read the article. You know what I mean? Um, I did read a capstick book when I was younger, and I really liked it. I loved the was the Black Death one about uh, mm -hmm. you know the the I loved it. I thought it was a really cool, great story. Sounded really sexy to me. Maybe I I could see myself hunting a Cape buffalo. That was probably about the extent of it, right? Then I got the opportunity to go, and I went. And I had a friend tell me right before I left. He said, "You will be planning your trip back on your first day." No, nah, that's never happened. So I get over there. Swear to God, first day out, I'm going. So, how booked are you next year? Could I come back next year and do this? You know, and it was there that I saw, and I began to understand how and why people can hunt elephants. Um, but the other thing I saw was what sustainable, responsible, uh, you know, countries like Namibia who have who regulate it properly and have done it right, how they can animal populations grow up and hundred dollars support it and and it's all part of a big system when i saw that um i i understood it i don't know that still to this day i don't really have a big desire to hunt an elephant but i'm certainly not against it for other people because mm -hmm. i believe i saw firsthand the uh this one village where they had these uh this string up and they had these old, they had Coke cans and bottles and stuff hanging off. So it was like an alarm system for an, when an elephant was coming in. And I asked about it and they said, well, there was a bull that was a year ago that came in here and killed two people in the middle of the night. Yep. Uh, Cody, huh, how Cody, do you argue you wanna, with that? Cody, you want to shoot an elephant? You can, if our podcast producer would just take exactly what Nick just said for the last couple of minutes and dub it in right now. Cause I was in the exact same, I'm a Kansas whitetail hunter who dreams of an elk every once in a while. Why do I want to go to Africa? And then I got an opportunity to do it. And I'm not kidding. Like, honest to God, it was slightly embarrassing the perceptions I had. Right. I feel the same way. Yep. And then I got over there and I'm like, huh, this really hard hunting with people that know what they're doing and are managing their animals very well for growth and sustainment and helping their economy and feeding families and communities. And I'm seeing it all firsthand. Oh, and by the way, I'm freaking hunting in Africa, right? That's when it hit me. Like, I don't know why it didn't hit me how cool it would be. Like, it's weird how I'm excited that even if I don't go back, which I will a hundred percent, if I have to sell a couple of safes worth of guns, I'm going back. <laughs> I mean, it's going to happen, but even if I don't go back, I'm going to get to tell a grandkid sitting on my lap one time that I hunted in Africa. Right. Yeah. Um, so no, literally mere a hundred percent. And I would, I'm not the guy that goes along with the flow, but exactly what Nick just said, I don't have, it's not a bucket list thing for me. Um, but, and then especially the last nine months working with blood origins where I've kind of been inundated in this discussion. And, um, you know, if you look at the facts, it's sad how first world countries, the United States and Europe basically perceive what Africa is doing is wrong without setting foot on the ground to include and probably the biggest example being the lethal management of elephants. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, again, where it's married. being where it's being done, right? It's, it's, it's a magical thing that's happening where, you know, hunters are bringing in all these dollars. I mean, when I, when I got to Namibia, one of the first things I noticed in, in Windhoek, driving out of Windhoek is this billboard. 
and it says hunting is one of the three of pillar three pillars of our economy on a billboard stop poaching that's what it said you turn in poachers hunting is what drives is one of the three pillars of this economy that says it all that's that's from the government talking about that and it works and it, it's true um you know the biggest thing that i learned there is that poachers are the issue and poachers are what have 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 killed all these animals not hunters you know habitat loss is the issue po poachers and habitat loss it's not a guy even if it is the rich guy i know well there's a rich guy who wants a bunch of tusks i learned that that's not the issue and there's always going to be bad people and bad things but i think responsible regulated hunting is not the issue you know it's in fact if anything it, we've proved that it's part of the solution uh, I know I'm I'm echoing a lot of things you guys have already said, but I saw that firsthand, and I wasn't one of those guys that that understood it till I got there, and I can't wait to go back. I'm going I'm going back, at, you know, sometime soon, hopefully. Good. Well, you both screwed up my uh, my question because I both one of you I wanted you one of you to say yeah I want to kill an elephant, <laughs> um, but uh, I don't I I I I don't have a desire to kill an elephant. My grandfather killed a lot of elephants in his life um, in the dedication. He's, he's written a book with Roland Ward and in the front of that book, he wrote a dedication to me and it's on the wall there. And it says to, to Robbie, the future environmentalist. And this is when I was, I think I was 15 at the time, uh, who will make it good again, notwithstanding the slaughter by his dedishka. That's what he wrote. And he was an elephant hunter. Um, so, you know, I don't have a desire to shoot an elephant. I don't have a problem with people shooting elephants, just like you two. Uh, but it's interesting, two things happened in that um, IUCN reclassified elephants from a single species to separating it to the African savanna elephant and then the forest elephants. And they have made both of them endangered now. Um, and at, in the same, that happened in, uh, in Switzerland on the 25th of March. And then in the same breath, Botswana gave a big old middle finger to the IUCN and just said, mm, we're still going ahead with our elephant hunt on April the 6th. So thanks, but no thanks. And Botswana has an elephant population of 130,000 elephants, probably the largest elephant population on the continent of Africa and is predicted to be three to four times over its carrying capacity right now. And, it, and how many how many elephants, Robbie, is Botswana going to allow to be legally hunted? Two hundred and eighty-two is the quota. So it's not a population control measure when 0.02 percent of the population is being taken. Yeah, yeah it's a human absolutely. wildlife conflict and issue, I, and it's a protein issue. I think that I've developed this. Uh, I'll just admit it. I think I was an arrogant American that was like, I guess I was like, they don't know what they're doing or why are they doing this? Or, and then I got over there and they know way more than me. I mean, I, I, I don't, it, it blows my mind that someone, whoever it is at the IUCN sitting in Switzerland was like, here's what we're going to do, Botswana. And, and there was a time when I think that I was sitting here before the existence of blood origins being duped into man those corrupt botswana people are just trying to get rich off their elephants I, I that that happened i can admit that um and it's a it's a sad state of affairs that i think there's a lot of people that think that 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 it's just about corruption and getting rich um when in fact we all live in countries where we have to manage our wild animals and some of that management is done lethally um, and they have 130,000 elephants. They Let's not look through it, look at it through rose-colored glasses either. Though that is happening, corruption is happening, and dollars aren't always making it sure. to where they need to sure. go. And you know, I I I I I don't want to sit here and act like like it, you know it's all great over there. It's not. It's certainly not all like that in Botswana. Uh, Namibia, to my understanding, is doing you know a pretty good job of making sure the dollars track where they go. Man, corruption is everywhere. You know, and it's, I, I, I don't like the idea that, that we try and present things like, oh, 
hunters have just got it figured out and we're doing mm-hmm. it all right. That's not true. There's, there's assholes everywhere. Oh, there I did it there. See, I went 30 minutes without swearing. Sorry about that. And, uh, the, but there are, and there, and, and there's corruption everywhere. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I feel really strongly mm-hmm. about that. I, for us to sit here and say, we got it all figured out is not true. And Botswana doesn't have it all, all figured out. And certainly there are, there are countries in Africa where they're hunting elephants. And they maybe shouldn't be, you know, as far as populations go, I don't, can't tell you what they are, but I, cause I, I'm not an expert on it, but I know that there are certain co- countries that don't manage their game properly, 100%. you know? 100%. So, and uh, that pisses me off seeing how, seeing how it can be done really makes me angry at places that don't do it right. You know? And, um, I don't know. It's hard to do with a dictator, I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We, 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 uh... Wait, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. The, the two elephants that I use CN separated, is there a genetic difference or just a geographic difference? Ooh, you're testing me. You are the resident scientist on the show. Uh, they are, <laughs> they are genetically different. Two different. Okay. Species. There are two different species, same genus. The African forest, forest elephant is Loxodonta cyclotus, and the African savanna elephant is Loxodonta africana. I feel like like half of your college was just learning how to pronounce these things, not really learning oh, man. the ability to pronounce them. Phylogenetics of, of botanical uh, plant species, I was like an ace in it because I just somehow got <laughs> yeah. this like lock away elephant type brain you know, since we're on elephant topic that i could just remember i can't names. even say the name of the class i can't even say the name of that class that you took let alone the words <laughs> in the class <laughs> plant taxonomy let's just call it plant taxonomy all right all let's right. do one more uh colorado why don't we go to your home state cody bring it do it what did colorado just do oh god i gotta pull up my list because i've um, the whiskey's gone let me just, I'll, I'll quote something out of the article then to jog your memory. I am pro-wolf. They got me there. But so are the majority, majority of Coloradans. I think the majority of Coloradans should be represented on the CPW commission. Right. This is one that, um, first of all, I'm in Colorado. The majority of Coloradans that voted in the last election by like, way less than 2% of the vote um, are, in fact, I guess, in favor of. So the Colorado Commission put a, he says he's not anti-hunting, so I don't think it's fair to label him that way. He is he said he anti used to be a hunter. Meat, right, but now he's anti-meat consumption and pro-wolf, okay? Those things are a fact. Let's not make any assumptions. Has been appointed to one of the, I believe, 11 commission spots in Colorado parks and wildlife. Um, And there's some folks upset about it. I'm, I'm, I'm of the, uh, I try really hard to uh, wait for a person's actions before I get upset at them. I'm like, what, what I, what my, what I want to do as a grown up big boy is wait until he actually does something before I get upset about this. Um, at the same time, I can't help but but make some assumptions that this is not uh, this is not a good thing for consumptive outdoor recreators in the state of Colorado. Nick, what do you think? Should, let me ask, let me pose this question to you, Nick. Should commissioners be appointed to commissions? Every state has a commission that runs the Mm -hmm. state wildlife Mm -hmm. department. Should commissioners be non-hunters? Well, should, what, what would I like and what they should do are probably two different, very, very different things. I mean, they're appointed, right? By, they're not, they're not elected, right? They're appointed. Correct. So that's, that's a tough one. Yeah, I think they should at least if if they don't necessarily. That's tough. 
do they would I like them to be hunters or at least have a compassionate understanding of who hunters are or what I think a hunter is? I'd like that. Um, I think that they should at least understand what hunters do for their state. I think they should understand what wild game consumptive wild game use does for their state on a on a dollars level on a license dollars level on a conservation dollars level both private and public dollars i mean going in i think that's that's at bare minimum they should have a a, a vast understanding of that and i i have a feeling that there's a, a large number of people on said uh um commissions that don't don't have that and that's that's unfortunate um but there's you know that's the uh what's What's my, uh, my dad used to always say, he, he who has the gold makes the rules. You know what I mean? So elect people who have the, the you know, that have the gold that, that will make sure they appoint good people. I mean, that's, that's the key. Yeah. You know? I yeah. So that, that, go ahead, Cody. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think that I, we've got 11 people on the commission in Colorado. We don't have five or four or three. Actually, you can't have four. It'll have to be an odd number. Um, we have 11 people on the Colorado Commission. One so happens to be this individual who says all the right things in this article. He's for the North American wildlife model. Yes, I am, I am not a hunter. I have been a hunter. Yes, I do not eat meat any longer. Uh, he understands what hunting does. Um, he is pro-wolf. But he also does represent a very large portion of Coloradans. And I don't see that as a bad thing. And I'm like, Cody, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for you to do something to really make my opinion. But the fact that he is thinking about non-game species as his job, I think his, his, his role is outdoor rec, parks and utilization and non-consumptive wildlife representative. That is his domain essentially and these commissioners There's that word have, again yeah non-consumptive yeah that's very yeah. true um and so inherently he should understand <clears throat> excuse me that all of those things outdoor recreation park utilization non-consumptive wildlife is tied to the consumptive side of the house yeah um he's also got 10 individuals that will explain that to him because Cody, didn't they uh, vote 11 to nothing against HSUS's petition for live trapping, correct? Yes. They also were adamantly publicly opposed to the wolf reintroduction. Um, two points that I want to make while I continue to battle in my own brain to not make assumptions about this guy until he takes action that I don't like. One, he was appointed by a governor who... 10 days before the official announcement of the appointment um, announced the named a day in Colorado, no meat day. That phrase oh, is not that's correct. Right. That's right. It, he didn't call it no meat day. He was, it was like meat out, like don't eat meat today. Um, I think those two things timed as they were, um, cause this is appointed a position by governor Polis. Um, didn't sit well. He also has, there is a quote in the article that says, I'm pro wolf, comma, they got me here. Right. And I think a lot of the folks, um, I have a very strong stance on the wolf reintroduction in Colorado. And to me, all you have to do is look at the county maps. Um, every county except for three that is in the area that the wolves are going to be put voted against the wolf reintroduction. That's 47 or 48 counties that voted against it. Um, and then the counties that voted for wolf reintroduction are on the other side of the Rocky Mountains from where the wolves are going to be put. So I have a very strong stance on that, but that line set really wrong with me. I'm pro wolf. They got me here. Um, Again, it's just an assumption. I truly will wait to see what the guy's actions are. Um, but that looks to me like someone with, with some stroke thought this commission was against this wolf reintroduction because 
of the repercussions of it, we need to start replacing this commission is the way that that felt to me. Just an assumption, but that's that single quote is why I posted the article in our show notes for today. Mm -hmm. No, and that's the reason why I used that quote when I was reminding you, because it's such a heavy quote, right? It's the fact that he would in a public, you know, he probably got recorded over a phone interview for this article that he publicly said, I'm pro Wolf and that's what got me here. Um, and that the they, wolf, he said, they, yeah, the they got wolf, me there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, all things happening everywhere and, 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 and let's not forget that uh, Vermont right now has a bill also being considered to create this thing called an environmental selection committee that will have veto powers over the secretary of wildlife uh, in the state of Vermont. Yeah. Something's happened, right? Do you think it, do you think I'm a right wing conspiracy theorist to say that because federally the House, the Senate and the White House are controlled by the party who tends to lean anti hunting? No, no broad generalizations there. But it feels like something after January 20th really empowered the states to go crazy. Is that, am I being a conspiracy theorist there? You know, it's, people say, wow, so much stuff has happened. It has because it's been the legislative season. It's legislative season across the country. It's, right. it's, it, I, I don't know the statistics, Sportsman's Alliance will be able to give us the statistics whether or not there's been a percentage increase in anti-hunting bills. I think it is up. I don't know if it is um, crazy up. But I'm sure they're all boldened by the uh, current administration's position around around hunting. Well, I think that that covers it all, man. Nick, you're by far the best fiddler we've ever had on this show. <laughs> Why? Thank you. Um, 100%. Here, hold on. So... Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's my wife's a, fiddle. Oh, it's my wife's wrong. fiddle. Is that I a was Chris wrong. Christopherson song? Is that a Chris Christopherson song? <laughs> no. God damn it. Oh, Dave, see there, I did it again. Now I just pissed somebody else off. Sorry. That was amazing, <sighs> Nick. Nick, any final <laughs> words? No, man, I, I could sit here and do this all day with y'all. I, you know, I, 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 for what it's worth, thank you guys for doing what you're doing and for flying the flag and for, and for, just having conversations and not just flying, just calling it how it is and saying this is the way and the only way. It's important that we're having conversations. It's important that we, that we educate people. And our way isn't the only way. It isn't, our lifestyle isn't the only lifestyle. I love that you guys are inclusive, that you're objective. You know, I'm just all for science-based decision-making, not emotion-based decision-making. And if that goes... And like I said, in some places that might go against us and other, you know, against hunting anyway. And in certain places that's, <laughs> but if you look at the stats, you know, they don't lie. Uh, you know, elk were extinct in Kentucky and now they are there. And that's because of hunters. Uh, yeah, it goes on and on. And I was just in Mexico and there were no desert sheep where I was. And now there is another are. And that's because of hunters. Uh, that stuff is, that stuff is so moving to me. And I love that you guys spread that word. I do. Thank you for doing it. Oh, you're welcome. Cody, any final words? I'm all shook up over the fiddle thing. I'm a giant fan of, of, <laughs> and uh, I don't really, I don't have anything. I'm just, it's, um, this is the greatest moment on a podcast ever. <laughs> Well, as we, uh, as we wrap it up, uh, Nick, I'll ask you to bring your fiddle back out and maybe we can end off with you, you fiddling out. But uh, yes, obviously yes, we are um, still in the middle of a campaign to feed the Hunters for the Hungry program in uh, Wyoming. We are almost to our goal. We are going to be closing the fundraising campaign April the 23rd, right, Cody? Yes. 
April the 23rd is when the Hunters for the Hunters camp, Hunters for the Hungry campaign finishes. And uh, we need all the support we can get to get over to our $35,000 goal. Um, supporters program, obviously you can win a ton of stuff, good giveaways. We just sent someone to Africa for a five day hunt for three animals. Uh, Jonathan West killed his first cool Mississippi, story. cool story, right? Killed his first Mississippi yeah. whitetail deer doe with us. Blood Origins last year, and now he's going to Africa. Random drawing. Amazing, amazing stuff. Huh. Amazing. And it's it's just, you know, I'm just so... It was random? That sounds like a conspiracy to me. That's got to be. That's gotta we, be. Hey, we videotaped the whole thing. Okay, we videotaped <laughs> the entire drawing. We, we've always done that with all of our drawings. We I have it. the video file. But yeah, Sorry, no, I didn't mean to stir the pot. I didn't mean to stir the pot. I'm just saying that. No, that's fine. We, 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 you weren't the first person that we said we videotaped it. We have it. Well, it's we because I didn't win. Because I didn't win, it's got to be a conspiracy. You know what I mean? That's... Well, since you, I think the reason you didn't win is because you're not a supporter. Oh, wow. Touche. You're right. <laughs> I'm not. I will be. I will be now. You just, I'll take that. I'll take that swift kick in the nuts and I will, I will, um, I will see you with a with a instant support when I get off this damn podcast. Shit. Well, Nick, we still have a date in a music studio, my friend. And I'm really looking will, forward to that. We will do it because uh, Nick Hoffman is going to be a future Blood Origins episode for those that don't know. Uh, so, Nick, thank you so much for coming on as a guest commentator. And... Uh, you can be the first to end out our podcast with a good uh, Chris Christopherson <laughs> fiddle play. No, this isn't Chris Christopherson. It's just fiddling. They're two different things. Damn it! Go ahead. <sighs> well, you have so much. You have so much to learn, man. <laughs> you needed so I just